Welcome to the BK Show podcast. This is episode number 17. And today I'm joined by the founder of e-commerce fuel, Andrew Udarian. Andrew also hosts the e-commerce fuel podcast. He puts on e-commerce fuel live and generally just has the greatest forums attached to e-commerce, I believe, that are out there. So I'm a member of e-commerce fuel. Past guests such as Eric Banholtz, Taylor Holiday. Brian Angel and others are also members of e-commerce fuel and I can't recommend it enough. I'm sure you've heard me gush on previous episodes about it. I'm probably going to gush today, but it was awesome having Andrew on here to hear his side of things, how he got started in e-commerce, how he started e-commerce fuel, the ups and downs along the way and so on. I do want to jump in real quick and say in 2020 online sales recorded 10 years of growth in just two months. Uh, sales have been crazy. Obviously, we've had a crazy year. Uh, but Ezra Firestone is putting on Smart Traffic Live again to help you get proven traffic strategies to ride the wave in 2021. So on December 2nd through the 4th, you can join Ezra Firestone, Molly Pittman, Billy Jean Shaw, Brett Curry, Rachel Miller, Jason Portnoy, Kurt Elster. Uh, honestly, a laundry list of names, 30 plus other experts for three days packed with the latest strategies in paid advertising and digital marketing, all from the comfort of your home. I bought a ticket to this last year. It was awesome being able to watch what I wanted to watch on the recordings as well as give our team the recordings they need to, you know, do their job better. And so, uh, I have a partner link and I made a special pretty link for you. If you want to check out Smart Marketer Live or excuse me, Smart Traffic Live, go to learnwithezra.com. Uh, that's my link. Again, I appreciate anybody clicking through there and purchasing. It is $2.97 right now. It's going to go up to $4.97. It's going to go up from there again. Definitely hop in there and grab it. You will not regret it. $2.97 is a no-brainer to just get the videos from Ezra alone, let alone everybody else that's there. So learnwithezra.com. Uh, and again, let me know if you grabbed it, uh, and I'll see you there. So learn with Ezra.com, check that out and please welcome today's guest, Andrew. You Well, sweet. Thanks. Uh, thanks for coming on the show, Andrew. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to find out what these, uh, these deep, dark secrets that you said you, you've <laughs> uncovered about me in my past. I'm a little, a little scared as well to, to see what you've dug up. I think, it, I think it's kind of funny, especially if, if they know you and they just know the e-commerce fuel community, they'll probably get a good chuckle of what I discovered on your website. Um, uh, I, I interviewed um, uh, Alan Walton yesterday and Eric Banholtz a couple weeks ago, and we've kind of been gushing about you. And so it was about time we got you on here to ask all the, the questions I want to know about Andrew Udarian and really just let anybody who doesn't know about you get to know you because you're truly one of the kindest, like most genuine people I think I've ever met. I don't even know you that well. And just you can just tell that you you're you're very authentic and that's hard to find nowadays. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. It's been, it was fun getting to know you last, you know, especially this last year at at, uh, at live when we were still able to gather and hang out. And um, I mean, you won the you won the poker tournament, didn't you? Yeah, inaugural. I hope you're bringing that back, or was that just a Texas thing? Ah, uh, I think we need to bring it back. That was really fun. <laughs> um, yeah, you took you got the iPad, won the game, like, and you were down. You're at the final table, like you were down, and it was looking rough. And then you had this like <laughs> you know a huge comeback, and it was fun to watch you play. So anyway, thanks for yeah, thanks for all the kind words, man. And uh, I'll try to try to live up to those two other guys because Alan and uh, and Eric are good company. So I'll try to do my best here. Well, I mean, it was uh, and you know cool to me you at e-commerce we'll get to know you a little bit better i think we talked more there than i've talked to you in the past uh, but i wanted to have you on here just to ask you some questions and really hear your journey like so one of my very first notes is to just point out to you that your your ebook way back in the day um that you you dropped that i believe in 2014 so it was like right before i started and you were kind of the reason one of the reasons i got started right i had heard of drop shipping um, so I started investigating everywhere I possibly could. And, and, and I found a course online, which I ended up taking, but I found your ebook. I found you talking about your businesses, which I hope we can get into a little bit. Um, and, and you were kind of the beginning of my journey. So it's really cool to come full circle and be able to interview, uh, interview you. Um, but I'd love to jump way back. How did, like, I don't know your story pre that, right? Like at that moment, uh, you were already up on this giant paddle still to me, right? You were, the, you were some guru on the internet, even though I realize that's, you know, that's not the case. We're all just some guy, right? Um, but back then you were, you were king, king shit to me, right? You're a big deal. And so I, I'd love to hear like, where did, how did you get to that point? Right. I, I found an article on your website where it talked about you were in finance back in 2007. I think the article starts with you saying, uh, my girlfriend from nine hours away was visiting me and I was working till 5 PM on a Sunday. And like, that was your wake up call. Can you, can you take it from there? Yeah. Well, it's cool that I had no idea that, that, uh, that ebook was kind of part of your original story. So that's, that's, that's cool. Thanks for picking it up. I'm sure I'm not the only one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, in a nutshell, the early days were got out of school, got into a finance job. 
uh, investment banking and it's uh, worked worked in that field for for about two and a half years. And it's for those who don't know, it's uh, investment banking. It's uh, you're kind of involved with raising capital or helping companies buy and sell each other. And um, really, really interesting, uh, fascinating, fascinating work, but also tends to be really consuming. The field is kind of notorious for taking people and chewing them up and, and spitting them out. And there were people that, uh, you know, just there were people in that industry that I I met at times that that uh, they looked a decade older than they were because just the industry was so rough on them. And so, yeah, I just, I, I didn't want that to be what my life was about. And so uh, really glad I did it because it, it taught me a lot about the business world. It taught me to work hard. It taught me attention to detail. Uh, when I think back uh, to some of like my first three to six months there and some of the boneheaded mistakes I made and the things I I thought were like acceptable um, for the associate I was working under. I'm surprised that they, you know, didn't get rid of me. So it taught me like it was a really, really very um, beneficial process, but I, you know, didn't want to live my life that way forever. So I quit uh, and started a CB radio business in e-commerce in about 2008. So you, you kind of jumped around, like you traveled across the country, right? Like, did you not like, you know, kind of quit your job and, and, you know, be a little careless perhaps for the first couple of weeks and, and travel across the country. Careless, joy, pleasure. These are, I, I don't know what these words mean. Uh, only efficiency, right? It's the only thing I'm focused on. No, I had a, uh, there was probably a three month period where I quit the job. Uh, I did a little bit of traveling and I did a, uh, um, I did a solo road trip or mostly a solo road trip from, from Bozeman, uh, or Montana rather out to New York, down to New Orleans and then back for about uh, a month and just visited a bunch of people. It was really cool. And then also went down to Baja, Mexico and back. So yes, I uh, did some traveling in that time. Uh, spent a little time investigating kind of what I wanted to do. And I didn't know I wanted to do e-commerce business. I was looking at uh, being an options trader, being a uh, fashion photographer. Thank goodness I didn't do that. Uh, or, <laughs> being, or being an e-commerce entrepreneur. And I kind of looked at the pro cons list and, and went with e-commerce entrepreneur and, and uh, kind of took it from there. So what what made you choose right like so right channel radios and trollingmotors.net i remember hearing a lot about both of those what what made you choose cb radios yeah it was i was very i was trying to take a very analytical approach um because i was i had fresh in my mind the experience from the last two years which was really beneficial but also like that's not how i wanted to live my life sustainably and i i, I had this window where i had you know a certain amount of money in the bank saved uh, that gave me a year, year and a half of runway to build something. And for me, the number one priority was was building something that I could use to create freedom in my life. And I, to be honest, I didn't care if I was selling, you know, porcelain teacups or if I was selling, uh, you know, high end guitars or whatever it was. I just wanted a, a viable business. So I had a list of criteria, uh, probably ten criteria that I thought would increase the chances of having a successful business in the e-commerce space. And then I went out and brainstormed probably 50 ideas. I went to worldwide brands. I went to, you know, if I was walking down the street and I saw, uh, you know, I saw someone operating a Bobcat and I thought, man, I wonder if people sell the accessories for those online. I'd write that down. So I had a list of 50 ideas and I, f- I filtered all of those through that, that list of 10 criteria uh, to come up with the ones uh, that I thought were on the short list, did some more research and digging. And there was something around, uh, I don't know if you remember this, Ben, but are you familiar with StomperNet? Mm-mm. No, I've never heard of that. StomperNet was a, uh, it was kind of like an online, it was on, online marketing training back before there was more information you could ever want to know online about this kind of stuff. So, so SEO, kind of like the original gangster training for SEO and AdWords and website design and these kind of things. And it was founded by a guy named Andy, Andy Jenkins. But uh, anyway, so I invested in that. It was like $800 a month, which at the time seemed like it just an unholy amount of money. And I mean, still, it's a good chunk of change. Um, but yeah, just kind of once I picked the niche uh, for CB radios and invest in that training, I just kind of locked myself in a room for eight to ten hours a day and cranked. And that was kind of the the how I got started. You launched the the one right? Like how how soon did Right Channel Radios take off? So like a lot, of, I think a lot of people listening to this come from the same community. I, I started. I took a high ticket dropshipping course as well. And you know, often the questions I get is like, how long is it going to take? And um, so how long before you were up and running at least, you know, making at least what you were making as an investment banker. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, I mean, this, this has been for, for reference for people, this has been, you know, over a decade. So I think it's gotten a lot more competitive and, and I don't know if these results would I'm pretty sure it would be hard to replicate today uh, or be harder to, but I think it took me about a year to replace my 
my kind of get to a point where I could live a comfortable income. You know, I wasn't making insane amounts of money, but a year where I thought like, Hey, this is actually, this is at a run rate per month where I can cover my expenses and put a little bit in the bank and save for the future. I could live off of it. So it took about a year to get scaled up. And then you like, what made you launch trolling motors that night? You just saw the scalability of it. You didn't want to put more focus on right channel radios or what was the, the impetus to start a second one? Uh, I think it's the same impetus that plagues so many entrepreneurs of like, Oh, I, I, I can do two things equally as well as I can do one thing. Right. Like, yeah. Um, so it was wanting to diversify the income stream, see if I could replicate uh, what was working with right channel radios. And in retrospect, like probably if I, uh, if I could do it over again, I focused and double down on that one business and just focus on that. I think starting um, is just fun. Like, it, it, I don't know. Is. New ideas are shiny. And then the process of like getting something off the ground and making it viable is fun. Like um, you, you do it once, right? And you want to repeat it, but you also want to walk around and tell all your friends, hey, just go make your first dollar, right? You want to help people start. And uh, yeah, starting's fun. I don't know why. It, it is. It's really fun. But it's also like uh, you also forget how hard it is and how much work it is, you know? So um, yeah, I think it was the shiny aspect of it, the fun aspect of it, wanting to diversify the ink, the revenue stream, see if I could duplicate what I had done the first time. Uh, it was kind of all of those things. Um, and not like a deep regret I did it, but I think looking back, uh, it's so, it's kind of cliche, but I think probably one of the most popular pieces of advice for entrepreneurs is to focus. And it's so stinking mm. hard to do, even though, even though you know you'll probably make more money and be happier and less stressed, it's just really hard to do. I love how you're talking about focus and my, my next little note is from that same article where it says you installed a VA to like kind of handle these businesses for you. And then you just up and traveled the world with your uh, girlfriend, <laughs> now wife, right? Uh, and just, yeah, kind of did your thing, which is amazing, right? I wish I could go back. I wish I could have started earlier and, and had a little more freedom and just been able to travel, especially now that, you know, COVID's around and nobody's traveling, right? I, I, I'm jealous of the, the trip I saw you take. Like, uh, certainly you were young and you just wanted to travel, but I think this is you, right? You just, you want to live a life of adventure. Yeah. We, so Annie, my wife at the time, uh, we were thinking about having kids and we definitely want to do some traveling before that happened. And so I thought if we're ever going to make this happen, like this is kind of our, you know, we need to do it now. And so that was the first impetus for hiring my first full-time kind of stateside employee, hired him, got him trained up for, uh, about six months. And then, um, yeah, I just took off for, for, for the better part of a year to just travel around the world. So we bought a round the world trip ticket from, uh, uh, out of Ecuador cause they were cheaper there. So for some reason it made more sense. And so, um, yeah, flew one way ticket down to there, hung out there for a bit. And then just kind of the, the way those, those tickets work is just as long as you keep going the same direction, um, you can keep traveling for, I think it's like 15 or 16 segments. And it's, it's super cool because they would let you change the, uh, the date of your airline of your departure. So you could yeah, total flexibility when you could leave. And it was great. Just spent uh, a lot of time traveling, you know, with Annie doing a little bit of work, but mostly just taking time off. And, um, yeah, it was fantastic. And that's still something like adventure and, and travel and things like that are, uh, something we have baked into the culture of our community, uh, with e-commerce fuel right now. Like we've got, uh, a month long sabbatical for all of our, our full-time members in the States and uh, try to make that a part of, of what we're doing now to keep that going. So isn't that like something you do with your employees? Is that like in, in your core values of uh, e-commerce fuel as, as far as like, I, I struggle to remember exactly what the post said, but is it something like the living a life of adventure and you kind of bake in almost like forcing people to uh, you know, have more adventure in their life? Yeah. It's kind of the, the you know, when you look at the company, one of our, our mission is, is at least we have, I think companies need to have three missions for what they're doing for the world, what you're doing for your customers and what you're doing for your team. Right. Um, and so at least for our team, uh, our mission is to help our team members live lives of meaning, significance, adventure, and growth uh, to have those things in their life. And so, yeah, we have, that's, that's, you know, uh, our team members that are in the States full time, uh, they get a, a month off every year for a sabbatical. Uh, and so, and I try to take that too, although I did a pretty terrible job this year of it, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's, that's amazing. That's yeah. Yeah. So I had Alan Walton on, uh, the show before you uh, it'll come out when we're recording this, I think. Uh, and he talked about like acquiring points, right? So I assume you traveled the world, uh, with Annie on points, right? E-commerce is amazing for racking up points, but, uh, he mentioned he buys each of his employees four round trip tickets anywhere in the country every year. And I, I thought that was like unbelievable, right? Like 
I want to work for Alan, you know, uh, that seems like a, quite the perk and you telling your employees to take a month off and just, you know, go do your thing. That's incredible. Yeah. That's super cool that Alan does that. And he's, yeah, the thing, yeah. I mean, e-commerce and, and travel, it's, it's so amazing how you can combine those two. And Alan seems like he's really got it figured out and, and kind of, uh, learned a ton about that niche, but, but no, unbelievably. And I think it's, it's cool as a perk, but it also, uh, Cool as a perk for your employees, but also just I think it's it's a signal of you value them, you appreciate their life out outside of work, and um, it goes I'm sure it goes further than just the, you know the three thousand dollars or whatever it's worth that Alan does every year for his team. It's cool he does that. Sure, I mean the points, yeah, they just add up and add up and add up, especially when you're you know buying a lot of ads and shipping a lot of products. It's crazy how many points you run into. So what happened with Right Channel Radios and, and Trolling Motors? Right, you traveled the world, you came back. And I know you sold them. You kind of walked the world through that process. If anybody wants to actually go read a very long blog post about it, I would highly <laughs> highly recommend it. It's actually really good. You're you're very in depth on what you did. Uh, but can you dive into that? Like what what made you sell? Right, I've sold a few businesses, and everybody always asks me why did you sell. Um, certainly the payday is nice, but what, what what was it for you? Yeah, so two of them, trollingmotor.net, sold that business because, to be honest, it wasn't a great business. It wasn't awful, but it wasn't nearly uh, as as I had three businesses at the time: uh, the CB radio business, the trolling motor business, and then e-commerce fuel, which I run now, still unknown, still. And of the three, I felt like it was just not worth. Um, I wanted to focus more, and it, and I felt like it was the best one to divest, uh, and also. I was trying to build up my brand to e-commerce fuel and I kind of saw an opportunity to try to pull a little bit of a publicity stunt to be able to help market e-commerce fuel with it. And I ended up uh, doing a kind of selling it through a reverse auction, which means it starts at a certain price and the price drops by, you know, $10,000 every three or four days. I don't get a bid, um, which is kind of a little unusual. It's also risky. And I also did a full public transparent auction on it as well uh, in terms of everyone could see the financials and everything. And so um, yeah, that was a fun process and it, we can talk about it more if you want, but it was, uh, ended up selling that business that way. And it, it, it was, it was successful because it helped me refocus, but it also helped with kind of the publicity because I got a lot of attention and then right channel radios. I sold that probably, uh, four years later. Cause I just, I saw, I looked at Amazon and I, I saw that drop shipping was getting more difficult and I was worried about that. And I was also ready, ready to kind of move on and maybe tackle something different, a little more complex um, and, and, and focus on something else. Uh, and so I ended up selling that business uh, to the guy who worked with me for, for years running it. Um, and I think in retrospect, I, I think I overestimated the competition from Amazon for our niche market. I think I overestimated the headwinds for drop shipping, at least for our market. And um, in you know, doing it over again, if I could, I potentially might hold on to it. Uh, but there's also been some really great things that, that came out as a result of selling it too. So those were kind of the thought processes that, that mm. went behind that were in the background on both of those sales. Yeah, certainly dropshipping still works, right? Like Amazon is is more price and, and commodity, I think. Um, yeah, I think dropshipping still works. It's funny to look back. Trolling Motors was on one of my old like niche lists, like looking into really? it. Interesting. Yeah, but it was all suppliers, right? You couldn't actually go to a brand, right? You had to use like a distributor. So your your margins must have been horrendous. They were not great. They were 10 to 12 percent, I Ugh. think. Maybe fifteen percent if you were lucky, and it was less about a margin game and more about a doll. I mean, we we we, we focus on high end trolling motors, and so we'd sell, uh, you know, three thousand dollar GPS powered trolling motors, you know, um, and so fifteen percent margin. That's you know, even ten percent margin. That's three hundred bucks, right? So you'd make a decent amount per sale. You wouldn't. The margin would be small, but the per sale value would be higher, which. Uh, you know, make it up on volume is the the best business advice in the world, right? Well, not so much, but um. <laughs> yeah, I had distributors. Like I had a 3D printer store. That was one of the very first thing I ever had. And so I had distributors. Margins were not great, but they would handle shipping and the process would be way better, right? Versus going to the brand where I'd get, you know, 30% margins on like a $5,000 3D printer. That's great. $1,500 a sale, but their process would be slow. The emails would be back and forth. Um, very much playing the middleman there as far as the customer and them. And uh, yeah, I don't, did you find the same thing? Like dealing with the brands was easier or, or you did like the distributors? No. So we went to, we tried to go to the distributors and, and uh, or the brands and buy directly, but the margin, the trade-off between the problem there was a capital issue and a skew issue. So to be able, all these trolling motors came in tons of different lengths, you know, shaft lengths and different size. So you, I mean, to be able to offer a decent selection, you probably needed, you know, uh, three to 500 things in stock or at least two or 300. And these trolling molars were 
you know, uh, you know, even at cost, you know, a couple thousand bucks. And so you're looking at half a million in inventory you'd have to keep and you'd have to, you know, fulfill it, et cetera, overhead or pay a three PL. And then the cost savings going straight to the brand because the brand wouldn't drop ship for you. They would only sell in bulk. Mm. You'd only get a point. You'd only get, there was not that much savings versus going to a wholesaler. And I've always been surprised. Like, I don't understand how most wholesalers make it work because they only make sometimes, sometimes they only make three or 4% on this stuff. Yeah. And they got all this overhead and all these employees. And um, anyway, I just decided that wasn't a trade-off I wanted to make. So we, we, we stuck with the slightly lower margin, but for a much simpler business and less capital intensive. See, I always had the brands tell me no, and they'd like send me to the distributor. And I think if you just build a relationship and, and continue pestering them that they're like, all right, we do drop ship. We just don't do it for a lot of people. And the margins are always able to change, right? As long as you stay on top of them. And, and, and if you sell, but, uh, can you imagine selling them now? Like, have you seen trolling mode? They have like spot lock and like they can keep you in one spot on the lake and um, it, it would fall right into your criteria. I believe you said in your, your old ebook that I'll reference uh, you wanted something super complex, right? So that you could put out content and describe the product way better than Amazon ever could uh, and really bring value to your customer. I think nowadays the trolling motors might fall into that even more so. Yeah. And I mean, it's funny you mentioned spot lock. That was actually a feature that uh, they had when, uh, when we were selling them. And so the idea is uh, for people who aren't familiar with that, if, if, uh, if you're out fishing a reef or something and you want to stay right in that exact location, normally the tides or the wind would push you around, but the GPS will control the motor to keep you exactly in that position. Um, yeah. And I think, uh, I'm not sure how the, the thing that I think would make it harder today is two big things that were tough for, uh, one, one, probably the biggest thing was sales tax. Like we had a super unfair sales tax advantage because this was before the Wayfair decision. And so we didn't have to start charge sales tax being out of Montana and I mean, if you're dropping 3K on a, on a trolling motor and you're looking at, you know, almost 10% sales tax in California, New York, Florida, wherever you are, Texas, $300 savings, that was, you know, that was pretty much uh, our, you know, gave us a huge advantage. So I think it'd be harder to, to compete in today's world. But, but yeah, complexity with drop shipping is you got to add value somewhere. And so if, uh, if you're going to get into it, finding something complex that you can, uh, you know, kind of add value through education, I think helps a ton. Yeah, certainly competing against Amazon, they're not they're not providing anything other than a, a product page, right? With a a little bit of information, content always wins. So, um, yeah, I think it would fit right in there. But it's cool that you sold them. I like the the reverse auction. Did the PR work? Did did you get the backlinks you were looking for or the press you were looking for? Did it fill up e-commerce fuel? Yeah, it was. I mean, it didn't fill up the it didn't fill up the community immediately, but it. Uh, I, I mean, I still have people today, like we're doing now, be like, you know, they're like, ah, oh, man, I remember getting on your radar or hearing about you from that reverse auction. There's a huge thread on Hacker News about it that blew up. Um, there was uh, when, yeah, it worked out. It worked out really well. Um, it was probably one of the seminal events, I think, in, in terms of building that brand that, that kind of helped uh, expand the, the reach and awesome things. So yeah, it was effective. So e-commerce fuel was obviously around while you were still running those. I don't, I don't know the whole beginning there though. What, what was the beginning of that? Were you, were you teaching or were you just sh- sharing or like, what was the original idea of e-commerce fuel before it turned into what it is today? The original idea, I wasn't sure. Uh, I, I, I kind of thought that it would either go the course route or the community route and I wasn't sure. And so I figured, not sure how this is going to go, but I did know that it, whatever you wanted to do it would be infinitely more, it would be infinitely easier if you had an audience behind it to do that. And so I just spent uh, a year just blogging for the sake of blogging. So just writing articles, connecting with people. Uh, that, that ebook that you mentioned, um, bef- right before my daughter was born, she's man, almost eight now. Uh, I went, took a little time off, uh, and Annie and I went to this cabin in the Arizona forest by, in Prescott. And I spent two weeks straight, eight hours a day writing that ebook. Because I thought if I really want to, if I'm serious about doing this, I need to have something that's good enough that people will share, hopefully, uh, organically, and they'll talk about it and they'll pass around. And so, yeah, I spent probably close to probably 100 hours just putting, you know, putting that together, getting it ready. Uh, and then um, from there, started growing the audience and the email list. And over the first year, just met a lot of interesting people. And whenever I'd meet someone interesting, I'd make a note of them or just tag them in Gmail. Uh, and then at the end of that year, I kind of, I launched a course uh, for training and then also a community that was focused on people who were already in the game and had experience. And over the course of about a year ended up, the, the community seemed like it was a much better fit, a better value add. I enjoyed it more uh, and phased out the course and have been 
focused on community building in the e-commerce space since then. So yeah, so that's my note. Like I I don't remember you teaching. So you had a course on you know just e-commerce in general, or was it very specific to like the drop shipping style you were doing? Yeah, it was it was it was both. Definitely talking about e-commerce in general, but uh, or definitely talking about drop shipping, but it was broad enough that you could do it without drop shipping as well. Uh, and actually, it's still live. Uh, I mean, I charged for. I think I charged like five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred dollars for it for a while, but it's got to the point where I didn't feel good continuing to charge for it without updating it, and so I just open sourced it. So if you go to insider.ecommercefield.com, you can see the whole old course. Check uh, it out right now. Some of it's, some of it's probably decent still. Some of it's probably woefully, embarrassingly out of date, <laughs> but you can see the whole thing. So look, it's it's a way to help people. I, and if I know you, you want to help people, right? You want to bring people together. Well, other than you know. Like one was more fun than the other. What, what was it? Like, cause I used to teach to, uh, and I'll look, I'll be transparent. I'll give you some ideas right out of the gates. Uh, I had a course and I couldn't stand to see 50% of people log in one time, maybe more, probably more, uh, log in one time and never come back. Yeah. Um, I couldn't stand people coming into the Facebook group or wherever you had like the people in the course meet up. And then ask you a question that was clearly in a video. Like they're, they're not even watching. They're just asking questions. And it just seemed like so much, um, a lot of taking from, from just people wanted more. I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. It, it wasn't, it wasn't fun for me either. And so I'm curious, like, you know, why did you stray away from it? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you hit a lot of the points right there. When you think about the thing I love about our community uh, is that sometimes I'll get emails, you know, uh, two weeks ago, I got an email from someone who pretty much was lambasting me for saying like, you hate little guys. You don't want to help any of the little guys out. All you care about is helping all your rich friends get richer. And why are you like this? And, and I can kind of understand that, that viewpoint a little bit. Uh, but I think the thing they don't understand is if, if not everyone, but if you are committed to getting into e-commerce and getting going, you can, you can hit a certain threshold. Um, if you're committed to getting there, you know, we're not looking to talk, you know, and talk, not talking about building Amazon, but getting a business to, you know, a couple hundred thousand per year. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's, it's attainable for most people if they put in the time and effort. And I love the fact that that was a, a litmus test to see who is actually serious about doing this stuff. Um, because I wanted to be able to have a community, have a, a group of people where it was sustainable because the problem you run into with almost every single type of community that's kind of like a, how do I do X with a bunch of beginners is maybe you have 10% of the people in there who really are experts in that. And they just get mined and mined and mined and mined and mined and mined for information until they get totally burned out and then they disappear. And then your community or your training dies. It just completely implodes on itself. And so to have anything sustainable, you have to have people coming and yes, you have to have people willing to, you know, need a, a form for them to be able or some kind of medium for them to be able to get help, but they also need to be able to have some kind of ongoing ability to give too. And if you don't, there's no way to create something sustainable unless you want to, you know, try to become the guru of, of whatever it is. And that's, that's not what I wanted to do because I definitely am not going to be great at that. So, um, so that was very similar to you. Those were the thoughts that went into my mind. I do have to touch on the fact that obviously that person doesn't know you, right? Like you, whoever emailed you that they, first off, they don't understand that you, again, you're one of the nicest people I think I've ever met, but I, I really, I feel like I could rant here and I don't want to just the world, oh, the, the, the culture that's coming up that hates capitalism and thinks all rich people and anybody who's done something for themselves is a bad person and that they're greedy. It, I just, I want to scream about it. It's so, it's so insane to me that uh, anybody could think that way and think that capitalism isn't a great thing, but uh, how unfortunate you got that email, but uh, you also el more eloquently put um, your feelings towards teaching uh, than I did. So you probably were very eloquent if you responded at all. I, I hope you just deleted uh, the message, but uh, you brought people together, man. Like you, you've brought in, you know, it used to be, Alan was joking about this, that you used to say five, six and seven uh, figure store owners on your, on your podcast. And it slowly <laughs> yeah. went to six and seven figure. I think it, now it's seven figure, right? In, uh, it in is, the forums. Yeah. It is. Yeah. We've got, we've, we've kind of got up over the years, but it's, uh, it is. So for, for the, the threshold for membership is own a, a seven figure business. And it's, that's not like absolutely hundred percent, you know, firm and rigid. And if people come in and sell, selling, selling $2 million or three or $5 million of stuff on, uh, Amazon, uh, existing product reselling stuff sometimes is, is, is easier than selling half a million dollars of your own proprietarily made product, especially if it's, a, you know, well-branded, uh, and financially 
the 500k product potentially can also be more lucrative as well. So depending on your margins and, and, and what goes into it. So we definitely look and make exceptions based on business models and, and how, uh, you know, the person's background and things like that. But yeah, it's, you know, I think our average store inside is probably at $3 million now. So three, three or $4 million and probably 10 to 15% of our members are, are over eight figures. So well, I think what you've created there is amazing. I'd love to hear like the beginning. I remember you pl- you came and played poker uh, on our Wednesday night poker group a few different times. Randy yeah. the Walrus, I think, is the name you put on there. You used to have this giant. <laughs> you had a giant handlebar mustache. You were like, you know, you were quarantining at its finest. I think, uh, <laughs> or, or or its worst. Yeah. Speaking of, before you know that, how's how's that poker game going? You guys still playing? Yeah, we so we play every Wednesday. It turned into uh, a pitch fest. Um, all of a sudden, Taylor put on Twitter, "Hey, we're gonna have." You know, we have a group of people who, you know, business owners, and we'd love to have businesses come pitch us. And so for quite a few weeks there, we had two different businesses come in and give us their pitch deck, give us their whole pitch while we were playing poker. Um, and right now we're, we're in the final stages of actually investing in one of those companies that uh, it revolves around sports cars that we all kind of believe in. So pretty cool. Oh, cool. That's, that's exciting. Yeah, it's kind of whittled down to the same, I don't know, somewhere nine to 11 people that, you know, kind of shuffle in and out every week. But it's... Um, you know, I don't. I don't think if coronavirus didn't come along, that I would have the relationship I have with Taylor Holiday, which I, I value greatly. Uh, with John Max, with there's a lot of people in there that I don't think I would ever have the the chance to meet, or even you know get to talk to you a few different nights on there, or Ezra Firestone, or Mike Michael Jackness. Um, yeah, uh, you know, 2020 is what you make it. I think it's not all. It's not all bad. I like that. That's a good mantra for the rest of the year. Is uh, especially. Yeah, that's a great mantra. I dig it. It's that was a fun time, and I feel bad. I for for the summer, it was hard for me to make it, but uh, mm. it's always fun coming in. And you always seem to be. I mean, I'm sure you had a couple off nights, but uh, man, you you more often than not, you seem to be on on the on the upside of the of the of the chip chip pile there. So I think I jinxed myself. I had Taylor on. I don't know seven weeks ago. So he was like episode seven. Uh, and we kind of talked about this and he was like, you're ahead, but I'm coming to get you. And ever since then, like the cards have been bad. I have been really bad. I was way ahead, like way ahead. I was, you know, quietly just taking everyone's money and having a good time. And it's been bad for a while. So I don't know if I'm at the top of the leaderboard anymore, but, uh, perfect. So this sounds like a great time for me to come in for a couple more games. You should, you should shake it up. It's been the same group of guys, a lot of basketball talk lately and a lot of investing talk, but, uh, you should hop back in for sure. Cool. Thanks. So you mentioned on there uh, for e-commerce field, you mentioned you, you started for free, right? Like you just let the first people in for free. Alan said, I have to ask you, was he the third member? He wants to know specifically what number <laughs> member he was. I know Bill Adelisandro, who I'd love to have on the show, uh, was an early member as well. Um, how did, how did, how did you get started? How did you get enough people in there to get it rolling? Yeah, I'm not sure what what number Alan was. He was definitely early. Uh, was, oh, Alan's been a phenomenal member over the years uh, and just a good guy. Really good guy. Um, you have a chicken and an egg problem when you start a community, right? Like, especially if you're trying to get people to pay for it. And even if you're not, you have a chicken and an egg problem. Um, who's going to come to a community if there's no one there, right? But how do you, uh, you know, how do you have any discussions with one or two people? So, the benefit, one of the great things that came out of blogging for a year with not a whole lot of agenda, a commercially driven agenda, was just I got to make these great relationships and get to know some people in the industry. And so, like I alluded to earlier. I just had a list of probably 150 people that I had met through my blogging and you know these uh, all the stuff I was doing uh, and putting content out there that I thought were interesting. So I used that group to seed the community uh, over a course of about a month. So every day I had that group of 150, I'd, I'd bring five people into the community. I'd introduce them. I'd you know kind of give some context for them, share what was interesting about them, maybe ask them some questions, introduce them to some other people. And it was, you know, it was a lot of work for that month. It was a lot of work for the, the subsequent 24 months after that too. But uh, that got a discussion going and built some connections with some people and some rapport. And then from there, uh, I had a blog that was getting some traffic. And so I was able to put up a sign-up page to get people into the community. For probably three or four months, it was just free and uh, for all those members. And then after three or four months, after I felt like, okay, we've got something here. We have something meaningful where... Uh, where I can, I can start maybe charging for it a little bit. I put up a paywall. I think it was ridiculously super cheap. It was like $24 a month or something like that. Um, but that was kind of how I made the transition. And then everyone else that had been in the community from the original, uh, before the paywall, charter members, as we call them, they just got grandfathered in for life on, on, on payment. So. so you must have had a grand vision of what this could be in order to try to do that, right? Like, uh, had you sold both businesses at this point? Were you, you know, just kind of riding the wave of that income or, or where were you at 
personally? No, I, I still had uh, I still had both businesses when I started the started the community. Actually, so um, yeah, I just kind of it's I I don't know if I had a vision for quite where it would go exactly, but I did know that um, there weren't a lot of people talking about e-commerce on a small to medium sized level. Uh, it was all talk about eBay and and you know Amazon and, and uh, you know all, all these you know thinking about it from a super high level and, and big companies corporate perspective. But as you know, there's a ton of us in this space that are, have these meaningful businesses. They're not ginormous, but they're not tiny. And there's a lot of us around the country and around the world that uh, um, I thought it would be cool to pull together. And I thought there'd be value there. So um, yeah, and it seems like it, it's, it's, you know, that was kind of the vision early on. So, so you, you scaled up from five and six figure, uh, store owners, right? And and you you were mentioning this on your podcast, which we haven't even talked about. You have a, a pretty awesome podcast as well, where you typically interview a lot of people that are in the community. Um, but you scaled up from five to six. What, what was it like having to weed people out? I'm asking a lot of these questions selfishly because I'd love to have you know a community around me as well. Like, um, how did you weed out the the bad apples? And even now, uh, I'll get a warning. I'm sure it's automated, but it's like, hey, you haven't posted in X <laughs> amount of time. Like, get your butt in here and post, or we're going to kick you out. And and I talked to somebody. Uh, yeah, my partner, Leighton Taylor, he w- used to be in there and he said oh, uh, yeah. a long time ago, he's like, yeah, I got kicked out because I, I didn't post enough. Apparently I was like, <laughs> holy crap, those emails are real. I didn't even know they were real. Leighton, say hi to Leighton. That's a, a good dude. Oh, um, wow. uh, despite apparently he, he getting kicked out of the community, <laughs> I didn't, didn't realize that. Um, so so two two parts of that, you can ask like, how do you, how do you vet people and, and then the engagement part? Um, the vetting is something we've got kind of a process now where we go through and um, everyone fills out an application and we, you know, we take, we take some, we take some time and sit down and look at everyone, look at their website. Uh, if it feels like it, it's at the, the, you know, somebody says they're doing, you know, $5 million of sales, uh, and everything checks out on their application and we can kind of verify things and it's coming from the right, you know, email address at their domain. And it's a highly professional website. And we go to, you know, Instagram and see they have a hundred thousand followers and their trust review uh, reviews are all, you know, strong. You can get, you're kind of doing a little investigation, but it's very similar every time. You can get a sense of, you know, 10, 15 minutes if someone's legit or if they're trying to, to pull one over on you. Um, so we definitely do that for all members. Um, we also don't let, we will let very few service providers in unless they've got some kind of existing relationship or they come highly recommended because we want to focus on keeping the community very tight, you know, 80 to 90% store owners. Um, so definitely do our work up front to try to make sure community is strong on the back end for participation. That's another thing too. And we've, we've got some, we've built out a lot of custom proprietary tech over the last probably two or three or four years that, that looks at all this stuff. And it's a combination of automated tech that looks at engagement and how, you know, how often people are posting and how often people are liking things people are saying and reviews people leave and also kind of manual uh, review from our community manager and myself. Um, but there's a balance, right? Like you want to, one of the part of the guidelines is like, if, if you don't, if you don't engage and you don't contribute to some level, um, you know, we, there's a good chance we may make room in the community for someone else. Uh, and cause that's just a par part of the community. If you're a big part is if you're asking way more than you're taking, getting back to that whole reason why you weren't interested in teaching, this is probably where we're the strictest. If somebody comes in and they post 10 questions, in a row and they don't ever weigh in on other people's questions to give feedback or share their, their experience. Uh, we give them a warning. And then if they continue to, to do that, we just revoke their ability to post discussions. Um, because that's really important to me. Like re- reciprocity is a hugely, it's probably one of the top, top three, if not the most important values of our community. Um, because that's what makes it sustainable. You know, we're not a, this is not a, a question and answer service. It's, and, and, re- and community is relational and relationships are not just take, 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 take. So I think that's the worst part of a lot of online communities is, is exactly what you said. So it's amazing that you've built in systems to, to weed that out. I would imagine in the beginning that happened though, right? Like um, I can't imagine every five and six figure business owner scaled up with you as you, as you grew and there was, you know, still some people you had to weed out. Uh, was that hard? Like, I mean, obviously I'm sure you got to know a lot of these people. You've been doing your, your, your live event for a while as well. Was it hard to say goodbye? I, I'm asking for Leighton's sake, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Leighton, for, for the record, I think he probably got, 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 uh, some of this is, is we've got some flows that, uh, that Patrick, our community manager and, and some of our others can kind of go through. And so I, I don't get to see everyone that cycles through. Um, but, but yeah, it, it can definitely be hard. Uh, but I think someone said one of the, my favorite quotes is, 
um, your success in life is determined by the number of hard discussions you're willing to have or uncomfortable situations you're willing to be, you know, put yourself into. And I, I see Patrick and I talk about this a lot, a, a huge part of the value hopefully that we can bring to the community is not to be uh, the smartest people or uh, you know, the people that are providing all the answers uh, or any of, you know, another of, any number of a dozen other things, but the, one of the biggest values we can bring is being able to see when people are misbehaving or acting unfairly towards the group and be able to make hard decisions and have hard conversations and, 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 you know, remove people who are not a good fit when we, when it benefits everybody. Cause those are super hard to do, especially if you've got existing rapport, but the only thing worse than that is not doing that and having the community slowly crumble over, you know, months or years. And, and those are your two choices, right? Like you make decisions in the best interest of the community, even if it's difficult at times, or, you know, you, you start walking down a slow decline. So it's, I think it's the same as running your business, right? Uh, you, you need to get rid of the bad egg. Even if they're your best salesman, you got to get rid of the bad egg because the, the culture might break and you built something special over there. One of my like next little notes is like how you tripled prices. How, how hard was that? It was $97 when I joined uh, and you were just like, yeah, we're tripling prices. Uh, we, you know, you laid out a lot of reasons why you needed to do so, but that couldn't have been an easy decision to sit with and, and decide to pull the trigger on. Yeah, that was, that was a hard one too. And for, that was something that, that, you know, we thought about for, it was something that we, we put off for years that we wanted to do years earlier, but kept putting it off and putting it off because it was, it's, again, it's a hard decision. And also there's a fine balance there between a community and relational and, and not wanting to take advantage of people, but also feeling like uh, you're in a situation where your, your costs are going up. Hopefully you've created a product that's much stronger. You're investing more in tech and, and feeling like it's something that you need to do. And hopefully you're providing the value to, to supplement, to support that price increase. So yeah, I think our, our pricing, we, when we started, like I mentioned, it was at $25 per month. Um, and over the years, over an eight year price, you know, eight year, what is it? 2020. Yeah. I guess over a, a seven to eight year period, it was, uh, it had gone up to $99 a month, but we were still charging a lot of those early members, 25 or $29. And the problem was a SaaS company can often grow and scale pretty much at, not unlimited, but it's, it's pretty easy for a software company to scale. Cause you've, you've got some server issues and some support issues, but uh, a lot of it is already there and you can just, you know, the, the scaling happens relatively easily with a community that's really difficult to do. And we've actually artificially capped our growth over the years to focus more on intimacy of connection versus scale because intimacy of community and, and growth are mutually exclusive. They're diametrically opposed. And so we just made, you know, the combination of wanting to keep our community small, but also investing a ton of money into the, into the platform over years, hundreds of thousands of dollars into proprietary tech and additional team members. And it just was getting harder, uh, to, to not make that decision. So hard to do, tried to lay out a fair case for it and tried to be fair with people in terms of kind of giving some of our longer term members, uh, kind of some discounted pricing, but yeah, had to make, make, make the call to do it, but I think it was a good call to make. So I'm going to guess based on knowing everybody in the community or, or, you know, a good chunk of them, they're, they're all awesome. Right. And they all, I mean, I believe your email said we're going to triple the prices so that we don't have to grow, like you said, uh, and keep all the cool people here that are already, you know, already cool. Uh, I'm going to guess your like retention was 98%. Like, did you lose anybody? It's, we lost a couple, a handful of people. Uh, and whenever you, I think raising prices is, is one of the scariest things you can do in business. It's also one of the most powerful things you can do in business. If, if the value prop is behind it, um, we didn't lose many people at all. We lost a handful, maybe lost three percent of the community, uh, three or four percent, and by and large, people were were amazingly supportive. It was it was it was really uh, it was really amazing to see how how supportive people were of something like that uh, when it didn't necessarily benefit them uh, in, on a pricing front. So yeah, it was I couldn't couldn't have been more appreciative of how the community responded to it. I mean, was that you look like you're getting emotional now. Is that something like you sent out the email and you thought you, your, your brain thought you might get a bad reaction and you were pumped to see, I mean, all I sent back, I think was clappy hands emoji and was like, you know, <laughs> good, good, like, heck yeah, I'd pay. I, Cause you're only charging two ninety seven a quarter. It's not like it's breaking the bank. Yeah, it's, it was, I mean, it was, it's, it's, it's super scary. I mean, anyone who's raised prices on that, on their, on their business knows it's scary. And then 
compound that with you've got all these people that you have relationships with that the community aspect makes it even um, more high stakes, right? Because it, it just does. Um, yeah, I was really, I was blown away by people's response and uh, their support on something like that. It just meant, it meant a ton. Uh, and it was, um, it was huge for our business and letting us kind of be able to do some other things. And, and yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it meant, it meant a lot to me. So. Well, I'm a big fan personally. 297 a quarter is a no brainer. Anybody listening to this that fits your criteria, you said right around seven figures, but you'll make some exceptions. I certainly know some people I'm consulting with that 100% should be in there. Uh, and so anybody listening to this, like go apply. I, I can't recommend it enough. I don't know if you have a, a little elevator pitch you'd like to throw in there, but I, I would certainly recommend it. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it, Ben. It's the, the 30 second elevator pitch is is it's just uh, it's a thousand vetted seven figure plus store owners that are uh, almost as awesome as Ben. So um, <laughs> almost <laughs> almost as awesome. I love it's, it. it's it's a great group of people. Um, and if you're if you're serious about e commerce and you want to be able to connect with people that actually get this stuff, you can ask questions too and um, and, and meet up with and, and in some cases you know have really deep meaningful lifelong friendships with as well. It's it's. I think it's uh it's worth checking out. So yeah, and if you're listening to this, that means Alan's already come out. So last week's episode, Alan Walton, uh, and then who else have I had on here? I've had uh Taylor Holiday on here. I've had Eric Banholtz on here. I've had Brian Angel, my business partner, on here. We're all part of that. So if if you enjoyed those episodes, you enjoyed those people, you're going to enjoy his community. Uh, look, I want to lighten up just a, a little bit after that. Uh, so I went looking for this ebook. I wanted to see the ebook that. <laughs> I referenced earlier. I thought it was great. And I also went looking for, and, and uh, let's see what it is. Oh, your job board. I went looking for both of those. I found links in your old blog articles that uh, they go to a 404 page now. And I have wow. to, your 404 page is the funniest 404 page I think I've ever seen. So anybody that's in community, they know that uh, Steve Chu and Andrew like to go back and forth. Steve Chu from My Wife Quit Her Job. Yeah, I would imagine a lot of people listening probably listen to that podcast as well. Um, but I love that it says Steve disappoints again for a four error. Well, it looks like it happened again. Another page where it's it, uh, where it should be almost certainly due to Steve Chu. Uh, this is my fault. Uh, a picture of Steve Chu speaking. This is my fault. And then it says, if it still doesn't help resolve your issue, we encourage you to write uh, an email and you list his email in there. <laughs> uh, I have to believe Steve's gotten an email at this point. Has he said anything? Does he know this page exists? I, I hope he does. And the best part is he found it organically one day. He was looking for something on the side. I didn't tell him about it because this is my this is my hope. But he just stumbled across it. And he did one day searching and I get this text message saying, what is this and how long has this been live? <laughs> um, I, I don't know if he's actually getting emails from it. Uh, I do know that if he was, I don't think Steve would give me the satisfaction of knowing that he was getting emails from all these people. <laughs> so it's it's hard to be able to gauge this, the success of uh, this, but it's been a fun, fun 404 page to have up. So uh, I have to assume he's one of your beginning members. Like uh, clearly you guys have a great rapport. Yeah. There's a, I think there's a podcast of you guys riding in a van. Am I right about that? You guys were yeah, kind of traveling the country. Clearly you guys are good friends. Uh, was he one of your early members? How did that relationship begin? He was, yeah, he was, uh, I think he was one of the charter members. I could be wrong about that, but um, one of the early members and yeah, we're, 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 we're very good friends. So he came out to Montana one time and we took a, I think a three day, three, four day trip and uh, I've got this old VW van. And so we, we uh, bumped around Montana for, for a couple of days in it. And um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Did a podcast from the road. So we, you know, I don't know. I think the whole idea of like men show affection for each other by, you know, just hurling insults at each other is there's a lot of truth to that, at least in, in you know, it, for me and, and uh, the type of humor and friendships I enjoy. So yeah, we're, we're super tight. We just like giving each other a hard time. Yeah. I don't think I knew what I was walking into. I, I went to uh, the first one in new Orleans was my first ECF live. Uh, and I, I see you guys pranking each other and like, you know, cracking jokes on stage. And I, at first I thought it was real. I thought like you didn't like Steve Chu, the very first point. And then I see you crack a smile and I'm like, Oh, I see what's going on here. Uh, you know, and then Steve Chu, I believe had a talk at that one. He definitely did in uh, San Antonio and he ripped you in his little side talk as well. Um, and so, I don't know. I thought it was pretty cool that you guys have this like ongoing thing of uh, ripping each other and the 404 page that, I mean, that's genius. Oh, thanks. I, I, I wish, I, I think I, I wish I could say it was a hundred percent original idea. I think someone else, I got the inspiration. I can't remember where it was, but I remember someone else doing kind of a fun creative four or four page of, I don't know if it was exactly the same, but I just, uh, yeah, I'm sure there's someone out there that, and I very well may have taken the inspiration from them. So not a hundred percent original, but we had, uh, had a lot of fun kind of, um, 
morphing it to be able to to give Steve a hard time at scale. Uh, <laughs> he couldn't couldn't ask for anything better. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of job board, right? That's where I went. Slash jobs is where I found it on one and slash you know your ebook link. Um, but what happened to the job board and 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 uh, what other like profit centers have you tried to enlist while having like you have an audience, right? That's the that's step one. Build a giant audience uh, and then. Uh, you know, at that point, you can kind of offer them a bunch of different offerings. And, and we'll go into some of the ones that are successful for you, one of them, which I'm going to rave about for you. Um, but, you know, what happened to the job board? What other profit centers have you have you given opportunity to? Yeah, I'm gonna jump into that crazy jobs is 404. And we need to, uh, that is shocking. Um, I'll, shoot you the, I'll shoot you yeah. the other link too, so you can find it. Yeah, please do. Thank you. That's weird. Because we had, I thought we had all the redirects on those set up. Um, yeah, so, so the job board, we did that for Man, it's good. It, it, it's kind of been a humble experience with with uh, e-commerce fuel in terms of just across my whole entrepreneurial career. Sometimes you get something that works, and, and you take for granted that it doesn't always work, right? Or it's not always a great fit. So, uh, for the job board, we we invested in that and ran that for for a number of years, not a number of years, probably eighteen months, um, with the idea of having it be just a, a great place where people could go and find great jobs in e-commerce um, with a little bit more of a, a focus on highlighting what made the companies different and unique. Um, but we did it for, for a while. I just, just realized it was, I think it was a lot harder than we thought. And we didn't, we couldn't bring as much value as we thought. I mean, there's, a, there's, you think about the job space, it is a crowded space. You have Indeed and Monster and Google Jobs and all of these places that, um, yeah, that are competing with you. And so, and also from a curation standpoint, it just took a lot of time to vet the people and get great jobs on there. And so we just made the decision after 18 months that, you know, hey, this is, I we don't know if this is what we want our core competence to be. And the only way we're going to be able to do well is if we really just put all of our efforts on this and we don't want to do that and forsake the community. And we also don't want to necessarily explode either in terms of our team and staff. So made the hard call to, to, uh, to close that down. Um, and in terms of other stuff, I've tried, I've also tried masterminds. So for, for about 12, 18 months, ran a couple pilot masterminds, kind of EO style, uh, eight to 10 people in a group, uh, paid on an annual basis, a very high level of, uh, of management and, and checking up with people and check-ins and facilitating calls and coaching and retreats and those kind of things. And, and it was cool. And, and I, both of those groups are still running today at probably four almost maybe three, four, maybe four years after starting, which, uh, which I think is really, really cool. And, and so I feel like there's, there's value that they're, you know, uh, they're getting from that just from get coming together, which makes me happy, uh, not to do with me, but just bringing them together is, is, was valuable for their lives. But from a, a, I realized personally that it was not what I wanted to do. You just get in there and it's just, it takes a lot of work to run those kind of groups. Um, I wasn't sure the economics would work if we hired someone to, to, to manage them uh, in the way I wanted them to be managed. And, and again, just after a year, decided, hey, this, this isn't the right path. So, um, and right now, kind of uh, doing something a little bit different with e-commerce fuel capital in the early stages of that, uh, which happy to talk about too. But it's, I think it's easy as entrepreneurs to, to, yeah, if you've got something that's working well, uh, yeah, don't take it for granted because it's not a given that everything you start is going to work well. Yeah. I mean, it's important to get different profit centers in your business, right? So um, it's interesting to hear what you've tried and what you haven't tried as far as having an audience, right? The job board makes sense. Uh, masterminds totally make sense. It's weird. Uh, I wouldn't have thought of doing it the way you did it, like EOS style small groups, right? Like rather than having, um, you know, even higher level to the forums, of not people who earn more, but a higher level, you can pay more to have more intimacy in a group, right? And so when you said those masterminds are still going, are they just getting together? I know like, uh, Blair Budlong, I've talked to, he gets together with Bill uh, and Craig Gentry and they have the, kind of their own little mastermind that they do every ECF live. Is it something like that? Or, or do you know how these groups are still existing? Yeah, I think they I, I could be wrong. But last time I checked, they're, they're just meeting on a monthly basis. Uh, so either they self-moderate or I think in, in one case, they actually hired an uh, a moderator to kind of step in where I, I left and, and kind of run the meetings and things like that. So, um, yeah, they just kind of meet once, I think it's once a month usually, and then they, they have a one or two retreats a year and either self-organized or with the help of, of, uh, someone else who's kind of moderating at a high level. Do you think you were just early on the job board as far as like it not really taking off? Like I, uh, 
the one that comes to mind is tropical MBAs like a uh, dynamite jobs.co. They're really, you know, pushing the remote work thing. Yeah. Uh, I think they got ahead of it just in time before everybody decided to work remote, but like, do you think you were early or just didn't have the right angle or, or why didn't that work? That's a good question. Um, I think, I think it's a combination of just jobs being competitive. And I, I think having chatted with those, those guys, uh, you know, we kind of, so I, I know Dan and Ian and we've definitely compared notes and traded notes and, and they've, they've done a much better job of executing on that, but they've also done a, a much better job of, of sticking with it too, uh, kind of seeing, seeing it out. And I think, uh, it's, it's always really hard to know how, when you, when you should give up on something. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know, to be honest with you, why it didn't work out. And I think part of it is probably given the fact we, we, you know, we probably just didn't execute on it as well as we could have for as long as we could have. Like those guys over there, they've great idea, stuck with it for probably two or three, coming up on three years now, I would guess. I could be wrong, but um, yeah, they've done a really good job on that and uh, probably probably executed. Well, I'm sure they executed better than we did too. So <laughs> it's it's hard to know the, you know, if it was how much of it was execution and how much of it was just the headwinds in the industry versus, yeah, yeah I'm not sure. Well, they might have the same problem as you, right? I don't know whether it's working well or not. Certainly, they're pushing it on their podcast. Uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, Alan and I talked about this too. He said you were a member of their their DC. So they have the yeah. same sort of thing. They have a community. Mm -hmm. They do live events. Uh, and then what, right? Like, and their their podcast is like super well produced. It's like listening to like BBC or something like that. Like, it's really well done. Uh, but where do you go from there? Where do you find Profit Center? So it's interesting to see what you had tried and and moving into the next couple of things that have clearly worked, right? Like ECF Live. Um, where what made you start a live event? I have so many questions as far as like, what were the headaches and what were the learnings of, of, you know, trying to put together a live event? Everybody says they're not profitable. I have to assume you have to make money from this or you wouldn't keep doing it. Right. And so yeah, talk me through ECF live, man, I could gush about it. All, I, and I have on plenty of previous podcasts of how much I love your event. So, well, thanks man. I appreciate it. I appreciate you coming out and it's bummer. We can't do it this year. Um, so ECF live is the reason we do it. Uh, events are a really hard business to make money in, um, both from just a uh, like a, a pure financial PL standpoint, but also from a you know. So we we definitely we're in the black on ECF, but when you think about how much time and energy our team puts into it, it, it consumes probably close to half the year. Maybe not full time, but it's it's probably a third to 40% of the bandwidth of what we do when we do it at any given year. Cause it just takes it, it events are just, they just take a lot of work. Um, so when you think about this, the, the time perspective, they're just not profitable. The reason we do ECF live is because we have a community and because any kind of community, in my opinion, people come into a community for oftentimes to solve a short term problem or connect with people or maybe get questions answered. They stay because they meet great people. They build relationships. They feel a sense of uh, a community. They feel a part of something. And there's no faster way to accelerate that and to really build string, uh, strong bonds and trust between members than to get together in person. Like it's it has always been true as far as I'm concerned. It always will be true. Like nothing beats in person. Uh, so yeah, that's the whole reason we do it is to give glue and strength and trust and, and uh, security and, and kind of depth to the community. So, and, and again, I've gushed about this before, but I'll gush again. I don't care because truly your event is my favorite of all time. I had no idea what to expect when I went to New Orleans. I didn't really know anybody. Uh, and immediately you, you know, beforehand you were sending out emails of like, let's get in these dinner groups. And I was like, all right, this is weird. I'm going to get, you know, put together with people I don't know. And it turned out to be the greatest thing ever. Right. I, I, I got put in some random groups, met some cool people. Trent Dursbid comes to mind as far as somebody I met in New Orleans. Um, and then uh, I think the lunch tables, you like my partner, Brian, I think got put at a sailing table, which just made his day. He's really huge into sailing. I think I got put at a golf table, which I'm into golf. Uh, and you could see the little tables around the room where you'd picked out what people are into and like forced them to have lunch together. Like, I don't know what I would have done if you didn't force those into groups. I probably would have sat in the corner with Brian and and maybe got to know a few people. And so uh, I thought that was one of the coolest things uh, that you did in your conference that I don't see anywhere else. Cool. Well, thank you. And I got to give credit to you was at depending on the conference you were talking about, like uh, this last year, Patrick just, he spent a ton of time doing a lot of the heavy lifting on those, you know, so we talked mm. about it, but he was the, he was the guy who was actually doing the, you know, doing the hard work to make a lot of those connections happen, at least for that year. So, so huge thanks to him for doing that. But it's, yeah, I think with the, with the event, thank you for your, 
thanks for the kind words, man. It's uh, <laughs> we try to put some thought into it to make it a little different, uh, to try to help facilitate some of those connections. The most valuable aspect, at least events for me, and I think for a lot of people, it's not the keynotes you, you listen to. Um, it's usually connecting with the interesting, great people. And so the more we can try to create environments where that happens naturally and you walk away from an event and you have hopefully at least one or two, but, but hopefully maybe even, you know, up to half a dozen, like people where you just think, I'm really glad I met those people. I'm going to follow up with those people. I generally connected with them and I'd love to keep the relationship going and there's a value add there. Like that's, that's the goal for us. So, and even beyond people, the last thing that I did in new Orleans as a group was get walked across town with a new Orleans band uh, and a police (laughs) escort. Like, how are you going to forget that? That's incredible. How did you even line that up? We, yeah, they, I mean, they do parades and uh, parades are a big thing in New Orleans with the Mardi Gras, you know, kind of uh, culture there, of course. And so, um, yeah, we thought it'd be a lot of fun, fun to do. And it just, it was kind of just involves some time and some calls and some, some logistics and, uh, you know, a little bit of money and, uh, yeah, we just made it happen. So I love how you're just blowing this off. That was incredible. Like I will, I will never forget that the rest of my, there was a few things from there. There was, uh, you know, the, the, the coordinated lunches and dinners were cool. Clearly having a a new Orleans style band and a police escort walk us across town was really cool. Uh, I went to, I don't even remember the name of the district in new Orleans, but I went there with Chuck from quiet light. I'm, I saw some things I can't unsee at this point, And so I won't forget those things either. Um, but you're right. It wasn't necessarily the keynotes. And of course it's going to be subjective, right? Some of them uh, applied to me and some of them didn't like the, the, the traction implementer, the guy, I think he wrote one of the, the books for traction. Am I wrong on that? Was it, yeah, it wasn't yeah, Gino Wickman, coach. but yep. I wrote one of them was Gino. Yeah. Yeah. That was incredible. Like, uh, you know, being able to implement in the business I was in currently and really taking some of those uh, principles into other businesses. Th- that was incredible to hear three hours of that. Um, and then I'm trying to think this year, like I got paired at a table of Ben's this year. So Padraig was oh, oh, must right. have just seeing all the Ben's <laughs> on that one. Um, and then, you know, seeing Leanna patch two different years in a row, uh, saw her on stage and I really got to know her. She's a, complete goofball, but I really got to know her pretty well. Uh, hung out with her and the Manly Bands uh, folks the first time around. And then I saw Leanna again the second time. And now she's my business partner in this pets business you know, behind me here. Uh, she was doing all the writing for me. I was buying her days all the time. And I was just like, why don't you just come on board? You love oh, cats. I didn't know that. You guys have partnered up on that. That's cool. Yeah. So just recently I brought her on and, and Leighton that we talked about earlier. And so um, yeah, a lot of things have come from that conference. And uh, again, just a huge perk of being part of the community. And I'm, uh, I was hesitant to go. I was really hesitant number one you pick like the swankiest hotels in the world and so like booking the trip out like the miles i'm flying there first class no big deal like i'm not worried about that but then i was like holy shit like you just have a a a flair for the elegant or how do you pick these hotels man they're amazing thanks we uh, we spend we don't always get it right but we usually will go scout the hotels um and see them in person consider three or four or five options so i think for new orleans i mean i I went on a trip. Uh, I went on a trip for that one where I looked at four or five different hotels and liked that one. That was the one that ended up working out. We liked the best. Um, and then for San Antonio, uh, yeah, kind of just same thing. We, uh, we we did a scouting trip and, and kind of kind of found that. So we we don't necessarily when we look for venues, we're not a hundred percent sold on a certain city. So for example, for the one when we did San Antonio, we were thinking about doing Phoenix. And I went to Phoenix and looked in Scottsdale and looked at some places that, and I thought these don't feel right. These, these do not feel like the right hotel. And so we totally scrapped Phoenix, started from scratch and ended up in San Antonio. And we really liked the venue there. Um, but yeah, just, so it's just kind of a taking the time, thinking through it and being willing to, to kind of start from scratch when it doesn't feel right. Cause San Antonio was cool. Cause it was like not tourist season. And so that, that town must depend completely on tourism. It was dead everywhere. It was completely dead. It was kind of cool to be, you know, in a dead city and be able to walk around and see, uh, you know, some of the landmarks and things like that. That was cool. Where was, uh, where was this year going to be? Had you gotten that far before COVID reared its ugly head? We had not. And we have, uh, we have a couple, we had one, that one place that we were, we were looking at pretty seriously, which I can't reveal only because it's kind of, we, uh, we kind of have a tradition of not revealing the cities. Sure. Uh, but, but yeah, we had one on on the radar. Um, Northern half of the U S I will say that this, this, this time, there you go. Um, but yeah, we're, so we'll, hopefully we'll be able to do it. Maybe 
maybe fall of 2021 at the very latest, hopefully, uh, knock on wood fall, you know, spring 2022. But, um, yeah, it's just, it's just too bad. We can't, it's going to be, man, it's going to be, there's going to be a party when we get together after missing a year. <laughs> that's for sure. Curious. So what do you have to think about, right? I'm sure you've put a lot of time thinking of what is this going to look like? Uh, it, there's not going to be a magic vaccine where we're all just going to be able to live our normal lives again. It's not going to happen like that. Right. So what, what are, what thoughts are going through your head of like, you know, liabilities and responsibility and, and trying to do the right thing and still want to bring people together. I'm sure there's a ton of people in the community who would be like, yeah, let's just get together. Um, but you know, what, what kind of thoughts are going through your head with that? Yeah. I, I think, you know, I think from a vaccine perspective, I think we, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I, I haven't been super, you know, following this crazy close, but I think, it seems like there's a reasonable chance that within the next year we'll have a vaccine within 18 months. That's uh, at least that's that's widely distributed. Could be wrong. Again, I'm not an expert here, but but uh, I think there's a reasonable chance of that. And if that's the case, that you know, then I think we're so. So you, you sounds like you're on the other side, though. You think that's probably less likely. I just. If you look at all vaccines in history, the fastest one ever was five years that had yeah. real efficacy. And so the, the idea that we're magically going to have one that has enough efficacy and enough people are going to take it, like our country's divided, right? There is yeah. a large swath of this country on one side that just won't take it. And then even on the other side who are, you know, maybe more mask wearing folks who are like, oh, I'm not going to touch that thing out of the gates. Let's kind of see let's kind of see how people react to this. And so I just don't think there's going to be some magical savior vaccine that's going to come along. Uh, certainly I live in Wisconsin. It's um, there's a lot of viewpoints here. I don't agree with. Uh, there's a lot of people truly, truly believe around here uh, that it's going to go away magically. It'll just completely disappear on November 5th. And I don't believe that either. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't envy your position of trying to figure out how to do this right. I, I'm going to a mastermind. It's only like 10 or 12 people um, next month. And I've, I don't, I don't know how to feel about it. Like I, I understand the numbers don't make sense where I should have to worry about anything. Right. Um, but it still feels weird after, after being in your house for six months, um, being told things you can and cannot do it. It feels weird to go do things again. Yeah. It is. It's, that's a good question. Uh, and to be, to be totally honest with you, you know, we, we kind of floated this idea to the community, like, Hey, we're thinking about, you know, doing a, an event in about nine months from now, if things are looking better and we got a pretty strong response of just, nope, 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 not interested. 2021's off the books, you know, just plan on 2022 at the earliest, which we were, you know, starting like early stages of a venue looking, things like that. And just kind of put the, you know, kind of put the brakes on that. So to be honest, haven't thought through it super deeply because it's really, I have, have at some level, but at some level I'm, I'm waiting to see how things pan out because it's really hard just to plan the contingency plan when you don't know what you're, you know, what the, what the environment is like. Yeah. All that being said, I think I am, I am not a highly risk uh, tolerant person, but I'm also not, you know, I'm also someone who will take some chances. And, and I think there's a, uh, not that you want to do it for other people, but I think there, you know, if we got to a situation in a year where there was a vaccine that was available that people could take, um, and we understood more about the virus. Uh, I don't think we need to have the virus eliminated like polio before we get back together. Sure. I'm not sure how that looks. Uh, I think there's ways, especially with the vaccine and for, you know, maybe it looks, if you don't take a vaccine, you don't come. Maybe, you know, obviously maybe you, you do have that. And I, I don't know. That's, it's something that I, I have not through, thought through all the implications and we're kind of waiting to see what develops. So that's a super long-winded way of, ans of giving you no answer to your question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to your point, I think that's the way the world's going to go. That, and, and that's a little scary that, you know, in order to travel again, I think we're all going to have like some vaccine app on our phone and we're going to have to prove it when we want to go places or hopefully there'll be like super, super rapid testing. Uh, you know, I can't, I can't picture in my head an ECF live underneath a giant tent outdoors where we're all sitting six feet apart and wearing masks. It just, it wouldn't feel the same. And so I, I don't envy your position having to think through these things and, and, you know, worry about stuff. Yeah. I, I mean, that just, that would kill. I'd rather have no event than an event where you feel like, you know, you're uh, you know, yeah, that just wouldn't be the, uh, it would kill the entire atmosphere of the event. So. And yeah. it's weird to think, you know, that was earlier this year, the, the San Antonio God, event, like it seems it like, so it long like, ago. It was like two years ago. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of the last things that I, that I did, you know, in a big group setting. And so it's, yeah, it seems so long ago. Uh, yeah. it's a quick question for you for guys. Another one. Tell me about yeah. this, this pet business you've got back here. I, I've heard just a little bit about it, but like, uh, can you grab, can you grab one of those things and tell me about it? Uh, I could, or I'm going to lose my headphones. So it's funny. Uh, I don't talk too much about this publicly, uh, but I'm happy to, uh, 
really just like glucosamine, salmon oil, omega-3, uh, vitamins, things like that for dogs and glucosamines for cats. And so um, I actually started this on a whim. I heard a podcast, don't even know what I was listening to, honestly. And it was, they were talking about the $500 Amazon challenge. And what that was, like, could you start an Amazon brand for 500 bucks? And the podcast specifically said, that's dead. Amazon's dead. The, the opportunity's dead. You could never do that. And I, I do not know why, but that day uh, I was like, fuck that. It's not dead. I'm going to find out today. And so I went on Amazon. I found one product uh, that, that worked. Um, and uh, I did some Googling around. It doesn't take long to find manufacturers. Uh, I found the manufacturer. Minimum order quantity was 12. Uh, and it was made in the United States. And I was like, all right, this is a sign, right? And so I ordered, I think I ordered 24 bottles. At, you know, I went and found a designer to make the label and got the LLC. I got everything started for like 350 bucks. Uh, and I threw 24 bottles at Amazon um, and it started selling. And it immediately, you know, back then you could get reviews without, uh, you know, necessarily having customers give you the reviews. Uh, and so, you know, I kind of hacked my way into getting that running. And then, uh, I had a lot of other things going at the time I had, a, I was partners on a adult coloring book business on Amazon that was crushing. Um, I, I was partners on a few different drop shipping businesses that I now exited. I was teaching back then and I, I kind of just let it go. I launched what I could from that manufacturer and kind of just let Amazon do its thing. I paid attention, obviously sent in product. I didn't run out of stock, uh, but I did the bare minimum. Uh, and Amazon did Amazon's thing. It just grew that business um, to a point where I was like, okay, I need to start paying attention to this, uh, which is right around the time I had joined my previous company. And that company immediately started scaling. Right when I came on board, we went one to 11 million in two years. And it was, again, got pushed to the wayside. So Amazon grew it. I I, I had some things going off of Amazon, but not a lot. And then I recently exited that company and I was just kind of sitting here like, all right, what do I do? Um, the numbers are there. It, it, it clearly is a need. Uh, and so I started putting some resources into it. I doubled it almost immediately, um, just doing what I knew how to do, which wasn't a whole lot, especially on the Amazon side. Uh, and that's when I was like, all right, I don't want to operate. I'm not a good operator. I'm, I'm good at sitting back at 30 thousand feet and really pulling the right strings uh, and, and saying, let's grow this way. And so I brought in uh, Leanna, who I was paying a lot for copywriting. And I just said, I'm done buying your days. How would you like a percentage of the company? Uh, and then Leighton had reached out to me. He said, you know, he's runs an agency in vision.io. And he was like, I kind of want to operate. Uh, and I was like, I kind of don't want to operate. So this might be a match made in heaven. We actually took the, uh, uh, the traction, the rocket fuel test of like visionary integrator. And we matched up almost like a puzzle piece of like everything I hate doing. He loves doing and he's great at and everything uh, I, I can do. I just don't want to do. I don't know. It, it matched up perfectly. And so, uh, yeah, just recently brought them on uh, and the business holds a special place in my heart. Uh, my, my, my cat started limping, I don't know, three, four years ago. Um, and, and I saw that that manufacturer had a glucosamine for cats. Uh, and so I get, I bought, one of my competitors products, which was the same product essentially that they offered, you know, stock without altering it. And, and it worked. My cat stopped limping within three days. And I was like, Oh, I have to sell this. I, so I threw my cat. I wish I could go grab it right now. I, I threw Leo's face on there. Um, so, you know, whenever his time to go is this, this will live on forever. And, and, and then that brought like, it, it brought, um, passion to it, right? It, it brought authenticity to it. It brought like what, what a business really needs to grow, not just some Amazon business. It brought me into the business of like, okay, I care about this. Um, I care about helping cats. Not really much of a dog guy, if I'm honest with you, but um, you know, same thing applies. I, I just, I, pets are like kids like, and, and to be able to help somebody with that, with something as simple as, as glucosamine, which is well studied uh, and vitamins and, and omega threes and things like that. Um, I don't know. It's been fun. That's cool. Well, Leanna's perfect for that because not only can she copyright and has a great sense of humor, but she's a she's a she's into cats as well, right? Yeah, she's she's way into cats. So <laughs> uh, she's actually going to be on here. I'm going to record her in a few different weeks. In, in a few weeks, we're going to talk about how we came together, and uh, yeah, hopefully get into. I call her the crazy cat lady. I hope she doesn't mind, but uh, yeah, she she rescues a ton. I think she has yeah. like a foundation in New Orleans that she handles as far as like uh, you know helping cats get off the streets, if you will. Uh, so yeah. That's super cool. I think she calls herself the crazy cat lady. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too worried about it. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel too bad. So no, she's awesome. I think, uh, anyone listening or yourself go to paramountpethealth.com. I think you'll see, uh, if you go to any of the collection pages or product pages, they all it, it, like, you, you know, Leanna well enough that if you started reading it, you would start hearing Leanna's voice talking. Um, I had her write in her voice. And so I bought enough of her days 
Uh, she charges like three thousand dollars to buy her day, and I had bought enough of those days that I was just like, "Why don't you just come on board?" Like, I want everything in your voice. I want all of her emails in your voice. I want her ads. I just want the whole business in Leanna's voice, and um, she takes ownership of it pretty quickly. And yeah, I don't know. It's it's been fun. That's super cool. I'll check it out. I don't have any pets, but I, I, I'm uh, I'm excited to read some of her copy because she's uh, she's done some work for us too, and, and really good job. Does really excellent work, and it's fun to read. Uh, there's a lot of boring copy out there, so it's it's fun when you can read some good stuff like the kind she does. Yeah, she's she's got some sort of other humor. I don't know how to describe it. She's she's really funny. She just recently. Um, rewrote all the copy on my personal website. I haven't updated it yet, so I won't, I won't talk about it too much, but she re- rewrote all that too. She just interviewed me for like an hour uh, and then came back later that day and was like, here's everything for your website. And I was like, Holy. like she's, yeah, she's so good at what she does. If anybody's looking for a humor based copywriter, yeah, definitely check out punchlinecopy.com. Leanne is awesome. Okay. I agree. So one of your other uh, jumping back into the e-commerce field world is it's actually one of the last things I have to ask you is just recently you, you started uh, ECF capital. This is, I think a new profit center for you, but I'm sure there was other motivations there. Um, and I secretly, secretly want to somehow get involved there. And I think <laughs> I've told you this before. And so I want to ask you about, it. I want to learn more about it. And then I want to give you a one more nudge on the way out the door, but just let you know, I'm interested. So, uh, how did that start? What, what was the, what was the idea? Where did that come from? I have a feeling Bill Delsandro was part of this. Um, <laughs> how did that start? He was, you're very right. It's, uh, it kind of started by so, so my background is in finance. Bill, we've talked about he's a he's a good friend. Uh, his background is in finance too, and and we both they're in the e-commerce space, of course. And and it, it had been something that had kind of been in the back of my mind for you know, two or three years. Uh, some other people had mentioned it. You know, have you thought about investing in e-commerce companies? You have all these interesting e-commerce companies that you see as a part of the community, as a part of just chatting with people in the space. Because I, I talked to a lot of people in the space, and the idea is uh, kind of twofold. One, we're living in an environment where uh, the investment opportunities are, I, I would say at best, you know, average, uh, or below average. I mean, just interest rates are so low. Um, markets are pretty high right now. There's been a lot of stimulus. There's a lot of money uh, in the world looking for places to go. And if you don't have an unfair advantage, your returns on standard investments are probably going to be, you know, a little bit lower. So not great places to put capital. And then on the flip side of that, you've got a lot of e-commerce companies that, that, it's, it's definitely gotten better on the last two or three years uh, with places to get capital for inventory growth, um, working capital, things like this, uh, SBA loans. But it's still to raise money from if you're an e-commerce business and particularly from people that know the industry, right? And so, uh, yeah, I was sitting one night with Bill and he really kind of pushed me as he does. And, and uh, he was like, dude, what are you doing? Like, you really, why aren't you doing this? You, I mean, you've got the finance background, you got the e-commerce community, like what else are you waiting for? Um, it's kind of a golden opportunity here and people could use the money and the expertise. And so the idea and the thesis was bring a group of people together, investors that had been doing this for a long time and could bring money into a, uh, into a company, into a deal for some of these things. Uh, but even as important, if not more importantly, could bring the expertise and the background to also be great advisors. Uh, because anytime you invest in a company, even if you invest just a little bit, uh, all of a sudden you you feel you're, you, well, you are a part of it. Even if it's a tiny, tiny micro percentage, you're way more willing to be an advocate for that company, to, to give them help, to feedback, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, that was kind of the idea and launched it about nine months ago and spent the last nine months looking through over a hundred deals. Uh, finally, we're in the process right now of closing our first investment uh, that should close in, in late November. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been great. And it's, it's still really early, uh, a lot to learn, um, you know, learning all the, the parts that are, that are harder than I thought, which is any business you get into. Um, but yeah, it's been good and have high hopes for it and uh, excited to see where it goes. But you have a lot of people involved here, right? So just reading off the screen, Michael Jackness from Ecom Crew, Drew Sanaki, who, you know, he had a big name in the podcasting world as well. Now is CEO of Auto Anything, Bill D'Alessandro, uh, Steve Chu, who we talked about earlier. Uh, Steve Chu is on there, really? Yeah, I can't believe you oh. let him in. Uh, Ezra Firestone, huge name, right? Um, uh, Ed Helen, co-founder of Playview. I mean, that, there's some big names on here. Shaquille, who buys a lot of businesses. Um yeah. Like, so how, how are you structuring this? Right. So I've been tossing around the idea. Um, I've been doing quite a bit of consulting over the last year. Uh, and then I, I don't want to say consulting is boring, but I'm tired of teaching the same thing. I don't know if courses is the right answer. And so it would be so much easier to come in as an advisor or come in at a few percent and really make a difference in someone's business and participate in the upside. How are you doing this with 20, 30 people that are on here? How are you structuring that? Yeah. This is the way 
I had to do a lot of digging and, and educational learn how to do this, but the way the way I'm doing it is that the investor pool groups, it's not a traditional fund. So it's not like we got raised a ton of money uh, and then it's just sitting in a pot and we deploy it. Um, it's more of a syndicate style model um, that, that we're using. So it kind of deals one off uh, here and there as they pop up. Cause I also wanted the flexibility of if I didn't see a great deal for two years, I didn't want to feel forced to do a deal. Um, so the investor group kind of had some conversations with people to get a sense for how interested they are, what their level of commitment is, which gives me as the kind of the, the organizer uh, idea of how much money we have to invest. And then when we do get into a deal, uh, we all just buy into an LLC. Uh, so we're all members in LLC and then that LLC invests into the target company. And then on my end, I take care of, you know, our ECF capital takes care of all the reporting and the blue sky filing for the securities and uh, all the, you know, the, the year end tax reports and, 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 uh, tax returns, all those kind of things like that. So, But does everybody participate in one deal or or is it certain people go with certain deals or how does that work? Yeah. Everyone, so everyone, if they want to, uh, is eligible to participate for every deal. So do my apps, make sure everyone has an allocation. So some people based, if they're more involved, maybe they get a little bit more of an allocation sure. and people's allocation is also based on how much they commit. So this deal we're doing now, there's, there's some members who committed more upfront than others. And so, uh, they get more of a first shot at the allocation than others do because it's it's really helpful to have them on board earlier on. So, uh, so yeah, so it's kind of it's a little bit of a dance figuring out how to do it best. Uh, but but that's kind of the philosophy behind who's involved. Almost everyone, if not everyone, is as best we can, and then allocations based on kind of commitment levels. So you just said uh, you looked at a hundred deals. And you finally found one. Um, <laughs> what does a good deal look like for you? And what is that? What is that? Are you coming in and, you know, are you buying 20% and the operator still operating it? You guys are just bringing your expertise. Are you buying majority of the business? And, and what does a good deal look like to you in case someone's listening that says, this is me? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The most of the deals that we're planning on doing are, are minority deals. Uh, we may consider a majority deal if it's the right fit and we have someone who's a, just the perfect operator. Uh, but most of them are going to be minority positions. Um, from a, what, what a good deal looks like, the things that we really love and want to go after are, we're not looking to sell the next Zappos.com. You know, we, we are looking for companies that uh, can either have a lot of opportunity to improve in the short term or companies and hopefully in conjunction with that, they can be around for, you know, five, six, seven years, defensible businesses that, uh, you know, that we can, we can hold on to and, and make some money from and cash flow for a while before selling them, if not hold on to them for the intermediate to long term. So, and that's not the case for all the investments, but that's kind of the dream list is a business that is, uh, it's been around for a while. Uh, it's not sexy, it's a boring business. There seems to be an inverse correlation between the sexiness of a business and its profitability. Uh, so boring businesses, uh, B2B repeat purchases as at least, you know, probably 25, 30% at a minimum, because I feel like it's getting so much harder online to get in front of people costs everywhere are going up. And so the more you can, the higher your repeat purchase rate, the more you're going to be able to, to actually, you know, spend money to acquire and scale profitably. Um, Ideally, we don't want to see a huge Amazon concentration. The more people are selling on their .com versus Amazon, the better. Uh, ideally, some kind of proprietary product. Um, the more often we can buy from someone who we have an existing relationship with, the better that is. Like the, the company, the deal we're doing now is, uh, you know, this, I, I know the seller well. And so it's just, there's, you know, 80% of due diligence, 90% is making sure you're not getting screwed over by the seller, right? Like everything is as it says, as they say it is. And so that helps a lot. Um, that being said, there's no perfect deals, right? Like even the deal we're doing now doesn't meet all those criteria. It meets a lot of them, but not all of them. And so the closer we can get to those criteria, the, the more excited we're going to be. Yeah. It's like buying a house. You, you set out your list and yes, you're never going to find a house that hits all, you're going to have to build it. Right. And so, uh, but what, what is your goal there? Like when you come in and talk to the person coming out, like what, how are you convincing them? Number one, that you want to take a minority stake, right. And, and what that money might do for them. And then, uh, you just said exiting maybe in five or six years, is that the whole company exiting? Is that your chunk? You're going to sell off your chunk to someone else. What does that look like? Yeah. I mean, usually, and again, just uh, haven't done a whole ton of deal on, uh, again, we're like I said, we're in our first deal, but um, ideally either our stake or the, or the whole company's stake, you know, uh, trying to take kind of a more of an intermediate to long-term position in it. So, and in terms of convincing people, I, I don't, I don't want to convince people, you know, I want people to be excited and say either, ideally the best case is 
I, we know you and your team and we know what you stand for. We know your expertise and we'd love to have you on board and we maybe could use some money. That'd be great. And we can maybe grow fast with a little bit of money, but really what we want most is the expertise that you guys can bring and, and to have a great advisor group. So yeah, that's, I, I don't want to convince anyone. If I'm having to talk people into, into doing this, that's not going to end well. I want people to be excited about you know, coming and, and about the opportunity. And if it's a good fit, we'll take it from there. When you say minority, how small of a percentage are you guys willing to take to like to have this amount of people in your corner would be huge. Right. And so you, you probably know your own value too, when you're looking at that. And so you're not going to just, yeah, we'll come in and take 1% and you get to talk to all of us. Right. And so what does that look like? Yeah, it's, you know, probably obviously the bigger the business, the smaller percentage we'll take, but we look to invest in businesses that are doing, you know, anywhere from 500K to, you know, maybe sub 20 million uh, in sales, uh, probably on the, the, you know, probably the, the lower end of that, that the seven figure range is the, the high six to low seven figure range is where uh, low to mid seven figure range is the sweet spot for us. Um, so that being said, like, you know, probably probably 10% is probably a minimum, I would guess, unless it's a really big, insanely profitable business. But anywhere from from 10 to, you know, 10 to 30% is probably our sweet spot right there. So uh, the deal we're doing now is a little on the smaller, not smaller side, but it's it's uh, it's a 30% stake that we're going to be taking in that one. So yeah, 10 to 30%, I would say. And then are you, uh, maybe you answered this and I just didn't pay attention, but like, are you convincing them to sell in six to seven? Like where, what are you, when you talk to them, are, are you, giving yourself the opportunity to like, let's say they want to leave in two years. Are you writing in the contract? We want first rights to acquire the whole business or, um, or some sort of, you know, contractually you're going to run this for X amount of time before we all sell or like, are, you know, are you talking, you know, like Shaquille, I would imagine would happily, yeah, let's, you know, you guys can exit. I'll take this chunk and, and keep it as my own or he might buy the whole business. Right. Yeah. So definitely no, like uh, you have to run this for a certain number of years. Uh, also de- definitely have it in there that, you know, we'd love the the first right of refusal if, if, if you are going to sell. Um, but, but less, I think most entrepreneurs, myself included, if somebody came in to invest and said, you have to, I don't, you know, you have to sign something that says you have to run this business for the next three years. Even if I had every intention to being tied down by that from someone else, I would bristle at, I'd be like, no, I got into this game so I don't have to, you know, take orders from people. And I, I'm excited, was excited to have you here and excited to have you investing alongside me, but uh, you're not going to chain me down to this if it, if it, you know, for some reason it makes sense for me to leave. So, um, so no mandatory, you know, if people, if we get in and, and people decide they need to sell in two years for some reason, and we're not the you know majority controlling stake, then that's their prerogative. So, um, but definitely want the, would love to have the first right to purchase if, if they do want out and we, we want to, you know, take a larger stake for sure. And I think you mentioned to me in San Antonio that whatever businesses you hone in on and you start seeing this deal, like you're going to see people in that group of 20 people that make the most sense to kind of take a lead on that. Is that something you're still doing of saying this one really makes sense for, and we'll just use his name, Steve Chu. Like Steve Chu makes a ton of sense to come in here. Uh, and, and Steve Chu would never make a ton of sense for the record. <laughs> Well, maybe it's another handkerchief. Let's, business. let's pick know. someone else. <laughs> yeah. But like, you know, are you still doing that? Are you still planning on having one lead? And then uh, on top of that, I have to assume because of you, you have creative ideas. Are you having plans for the future of like getting together with uh, your investees and your investors and having, you know, some sort of almost like retreat like that? Or like, what, what are some cool ideas that beyond just having access to Michael Jackness or Drew Sinaki or Ezra Firestone? Uh, I'm sure you've thought of other ideas. Yeah. I mean, like you mentioned, having a, uh, having one person, one or two people who have the most crossover expertise, uh, kind of be more involved in the deal. Uh, so for, for the dealer doing now, there's a couple of people who are, are taking a much larger role in it and, you know, getting compensated accordingly, but, but they're taking a much larger role because it just fits with their skill set. So that's part of it. Uh, getting a little, you know, maybe getting deeper access to some of the more relevant talent. Um, and yeah, I'd love to, once we get, you know, a handful of deals in the bag, I'd absolutely love to, to get everyone together in person um, to, to meet and, and, and kind of have a little in-person uh, event because I think there's a ton that could happen in person that would, you know, just expedite the, the brainstorming and the learning process. So for sure. I'm, I'm excited to follow you. I think it's a really cool idea. It's something I've considered on both sides. I, when I brought on Leanna and Layton, I left uh, a small percentage uh, under 10%, but I left that to bring in people uh, that you, like you have in this group of like, who can come in here and really help me on, on areas I'm not good at, or in just business in general, like Bill Delchandra would be amazing to have as an advisor in any business. He just, the dude thinks 
about things at a deeper level than most people do. He's a very, very smart human being. Sharp and so, dude. Yeah. And so like, I've thought of this on both sides. So I, I'm really excited to like, watch what you guys do here and, and, you know, hopefully take notes. And, and, and I know just knowing you, you're going to have a unique spin on this that, uh, other advisors may not. And so I think I'm excited to see whatever creative ideas you come up with there too. Cool. Well, thanks, man. Yeah. And, and pre- thank you. It's, it'll be a learning process, very much learning along, uh, you know, as we're going along, but uh, yeah, excited to see how it goes and always happy to share notes with you as you're thinking about doing it too. So. Yeah, no. And I, and I, and I, I mentioned before, I'll just nudge you again. I'm certainly interested. So let me know what size image you need for my uh, image on that page. <laughs> uh, and we'll figure it out from there. But uh, Hey, look, I appreciate having you on. The one last question I had for you was like, uh, where are you going from here? So you've tried some profit centers, the job boards didn't work. You tried teaching that didn't work. Uh, obviously ECF live is amazing. It's, it's huge. Capital is just getting rolling, starting to work. Where are you going from here? Like, uh, I know you like to live uh, a wild, a wild life of adventure and spend a lot of time with your family, which is amazing. Um, and you try to design your businesses around that. So knowing that where, where are you going from here? I think from here, just doing what we're doing and doing it better. So I'd love to, instead of, uh, I feel like the last two or three years from, from where we live to kind of how the business looks uh, on the form front and in the community front, we've spent the last two years doing a ton of improvements on the tech side and, and the infrastructure side uh, that we finally have wrapped up on the ECF capital side, finally have that going uh, for my family. We just kind of made a big move to Arizona the last, uh, last couple of years and, and just, you know, finally settling down here. And so, yeah, I think right now it's, it's, it's more about just focusing and executing well on the things that I already have going. So, and, and being able to take a little more time. I've got kids that are, you know, uh, I don't know if you heard, but about, you know, uh, 60 seconds ago, I had a little, little hand knocking on the door, uh, you know, kids coming up to the office and, and, uh, kids are, you know, two, five and seven, and it's a really fun time to hang out with them. And so want to, want to focus on what we've built and make sure we just nurture that really well and continue to grow the community and, and focus on the e-commerce fuel capital side and, and spend a lot of time with the family. And, and, uh, I don't think I necessarily want to try to grow anything else right now. Uh, I would just want to do what we're doing well and make sure we, we execute on it really uh, at, at a high level. So, I mean, I after, kind of, yeah. after Google maps getting huge and you deciding to launch a map holder for vehicles, um, <laughs> like you're not going back to e-commerce after that massive win. Ex- exactly, man. Like, I mean, you see the judgment that I'm working with here. It's, 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 it's D minus at best. And so I'm, uh, I'm going to stick to with what I got. Well, we gave Steve enough crap. I figured I'd throw one in for him to to, to rib back at you. Hey, look, oh, I appreciate I, yeah. I appreciate having you on. Um, uh, certainly, everyone, if you if you uh, are up to the standards of e-commerce fuel forums, go join. Uh, it's I can't recommend it enough. And I will see you at ECF Live whenever that happens again. Uh, go listen to his podcast. I'll put all of these links in the show notes. But what's the best way to reach out to you, Andrew? Yeah, Twitter is is usually the best. Um, so if you're on Twitter at Udarian, Y O U D E R I A N is the best way to get a hold of me and uh, connect about something. So that's where a check on there. And um, yeah, at Udarian on Twitter. Nice. Well, thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for being part of the community too. It's been good getting to know you the last couple of years a little bit more, and playing some cards, and just kind of getting to know your story more and uh, and hang out. So um, yeah, appreciate that. Appreciate you being part of the community. And thanks for the invite. This was fun. Thanks, man. I hope you enjoyed that talk with Andrew Darian and Steve Chu. If you're listening, I hope you don't mind a little bit of ribbing we gave you in there. Uh, I'd love to have you on the podcast as well and hear your story, Steve, and maybe we can rib Andrew back. Uh, but I hope you guys learned something. I hope you learn, you know, Andrew's journey uh, and, and learn really the value he brings in that forum. If you think your business is ready, if you're at around seven figures, uh, join, apply to join. Like honestly, you are not going to regret joining this forum. There's so much value in there, and at two ninety seven a quarter, it's kind of a no brainer. Uh, speaking of 297, like I said at the beginning of the show, if you go to learnwithezra.com, you can join Smart Traffic Live for 297. It's a three day event. Uh, you're going to get all the videos. It's kind of a no brainer for you, for your team. Uh, and I appreciate anybody who clicks through my partner link. Again, learnwithezra.com. Uh, I appreciate all of you, and I will see all of you next Wednesday.